Billowing flags represent the nationalities of the many riders who compete in motocross racing. Yamaha's team for 1981 reflected that international flavor with riders from five nations. Sweden's Hakan Karlqvist and Belgian Andre Romans rode the 500s. Englishman Neil Hudson and Dave Watson from Ireland in 250. And in the 125s, Belgium's Mark Velkeneers and France's Jackie Vimon. Three rounds of the 500cc championship, Romans is in second place, but the fourth round is here in Vastra, Sweden, and Karlquist, a national hero, is determined to establish himself amongst the title leader. An early leader is Graham Noyce, former world champion, with Romans and Karlquist following in second and third spots. Carlquist has said that he's going to make a real fight out of this year's championship, and this is where he's going to try his hardest. Romans, the second man in the team, will be out to win, too. Carlquist is in his most aggressive form in the second moto and leads the field home to take overall second place. Title chase is coming to life. The Swedes now fourth in the championship, and with the advantage of a race win behind him, his challenge is much stronger. At the quiet town of Tricic in Yugoslavia, it's almost the midway point in the 12 round 125 cc championship. Everts, Velkaniers, Gabors, Andriani, Vimond, and Rinaldi are the top championship contenders. World champion Harry Everts is first away in the first moto. With the riders bunched, the first few bends are critical, and championship contender Rinaldi is one of those who crashes, but he's quick to get up again and continue the race. Velkaniers has a flamboyant, aggressive style that makes the crowd keep an eye on him. By the seventh lap, Velkaniers has passed Raie, and he's in second place behind Everts. As so often happens in motocross, the Belgians are ahead. Remember Rinaldi on lap one? He's still having troubles. Everts is first across the line, with Velkaners behind him. The young Yamaha rider takes third position in the second moto, and that puts him second in the overall ratings. The band plays, the crowd cheers, and Mark Velkaners is a happy man. Heike Mikola has won four motocross world championships. 
He switched to the 500cc class with Yamaha after two wins in 250 and brought the company the world title in 1977 and 1978. Still with Yamaha as technical advisor to their Grand Prix team, Heike knows how important training is for a rider. Heike, motocross is obviously a demanding sport, but just how important is physical fitness? Yes. In Grand Prix racing, there are two races, each lasting 40 minutes plus two laps. So you need a good physique. Unless you have sufficient strength, you'd be exhausted after five or ten minutes riding and you'd probably crash. What sort of training schedule do you recommend to, to get fit and also to keep in shape during the season? In the winter, when you're not riding a motorcycle, say from November to January, you need continuous hard training running long distances, lifting weights, things like that. Then about a month before the start of the racing season, you should start riding the motorcycle and applying that physical strength to it. But it's all useless unless you do it every day. Yamaha factory riders don't just have the job of winning races. They also have to develop and test new ideas and improve designs. Improvements that will be incorporated into the following year's production machines. The Yamaha power valve system and Yamaha energy induction system. The rising rate monocross suspension, liquid cooling. They were all developed and tested by Yamaha Grand Prix riders. Neil Hudson from Great Britain and David Watson from Ireland are two young newcomers to the Yamaha team for the 1981 season. But uh, not as young as these two. Grand Prix is the third race in the 250cc championship and in practice Hudson had shown that he felt at home on the loose sandy circuit. In the first moto he takes an early lead and with a display of cool controlled riding scores his first Grand Prix win of 1981. This time it's Hudson's Yamaha teammate Dave Watson who is the early leader from Jobe and Hudson. Midway through the race, however, Watson hits trouble, and it's Hudson who takes over the lead from Jobe. The Belgian world champion challenges the young Englishman and manages to snatch the lead. He holds it to the drop of the flag, but a win and a second place for Hudson give him overall victory. It's clear that in the race to the world championship, it is these two who will be the principal contenders. In Grand Prix racing, there are two hours of untimed practice on the day before the race. They're necessary in order to assess the circuit. For instance, to check where the ground is hard or soft, to find the correct jump points, the uneven spots, to find the most effective line to take, 
and to judge how best to prepare the machine to match the circuit for the race the next day. I'll show you how we set up a machine. First, the front forks. The spring loadings, oil viscosity and air pressure are all adjusted according to the demands of each circuit. This is the power valve and this is the Yamaha energy induction system. They're both very important in improving the engine's torque and power output throughout its range. Next is the carburetor setting. With air temperature and pressure as the critical factors, the setting is done to match the characteristics of each circuit. Gear ratios are selected according to the corners and the gradients of the circuit. The choice of gear ratios is of course also vital at the start of the race. This is the unique monocross suspension which was developed by Yamaha. Setting the rear suspension is one of the most important aspects of tuning the machine. Every circuit condition, especially the jumps and the corners, have to be taken into consideration when we set the springs and the dampers. Finally, there's the selection of tyres. It goes without saying that the choice of tyre is dictated by the type of circuit and whether the ground is hard or sandy or wet. This way the rider goes out in timed practice with a machine that's tailored to the circuit and which will enable him to ride at his best. Let's look at some riding techniques now. Cornering technique can be broken down into three areas. Braking, entering the bend and leaving it. you have to slow down before you enter a bend. As you slow down, you straighten up to a sitting position and enter the corner on the best line. The front brake applied first, followed by the rear. The important thing is that you use the braking power of the engine at the same time. Entering the bend, the rider must sit as far forward as possible, whilst keeping his speed as high as he can without losing his balance. Leaving the bend, the throttle is opened wide and gear changes are made as quickly as possible to build up speed rapidly. Jumping is one of the most important techniques in motocross. There's always the possibility that if the jump is too high or too hard, the machine will be damaged on landing. The accelerator should be opened slightly before the jump point, the body should be moved back and the front of the machine raised. On the landing, the back tyre must touch down first. Again, the rider must be ready to accelerate the machine to high speed straight away. For downhill riding, the rider needs to place himself slightly to the rear to dampen the rebound of the back tyre and take his body weight on his legs. On the other hand, when riding uphill, the rider has to move forward to stop the front wheel from lifting while still maintaining that half standing position. The vital consideration in starting is to keep the bike in a straight line and everything's directed towards achieving this. The first thing to be considered is the choice of gear. First gear's too low and third is too high, so second's usually the one that's used. Before starting, the rider sits as far forward as possible. Once underway, he moves back gradually as the back tyre gets a grip until he's in the normal position. One foot or both feet can be touching the ground at the start.
500 cc series has reached Holland, where Romans demonstrates his unique talent in the deep sandy condition. For Carl Quist, there is still an outside chance of winning the world title, and his riding is full of aggression and determination. second moto, Carl Quist and the championship leader Andre Malev are locked in a fierce race-long battle for second place. But the race belongs to Romans, the sand specialist. place for Carl Quist earns him overall third spot in the Grand Prix and keeps him in touch with the championship leaders. For Hudson, the title race has reached England and there are thousands of patriotic fans willing him to victory. Jobe has a 56-point lead, but with that crowd behind him, Hudson is determined to reduce it. If I'm not world champion this year, I think Hudson is is the, the, the second or the, the first to be world champion. Van der Van is third, but he's only good on sand, sand course. On hard course, he's, he is slower than, than Hudson. Hudson is pretty good on almost every, uh, every track. So it's the most important thing. At the start of the race, Hudson and Joby are in the leading group along with Wright, Van der Ven, and Tarkanen. Disaster strikes for Joe Bay on the ninth lap when an engine failure knocks him out of the race and he has to walk back to the pits. The British fans don't have any time for sympathy, however. They're too busy cheering Neil Hudson in the lead and full of confidence. Lap by lap, Hudson increases his lead over a second place man, Van Der Ven. And at the flag, the gap is 23 seconds. As the spectators start on their way home, Neil Hudson cools himself down and thinks, no doubt, about how the heat of the title race is increasing. vans head back to their headquarters, the Yamaha workshop in Amsterdam. They won't be needed for a couple of weeks because the next race is in the United States. 
for Neil Hudson, the transatlantic trip is a good one, with another win to add to his score. The result is the same in the next race, held in the Soviet Union, and now there is only one Grand Prix to go at Appledorn in Holland. The night before the race, Neil looked back on the season so far and told what he felt about his chances. 1981, I was riding for Yamaha, which was very good for me. I was looking forward to it very much. And now, after a bad start, first few GPs, the machine's working much better now. And at the last GP now, we are in aim with a good chance of a championship. So, I hope everything goes same as it's been going for the last three GPs. And I hope tomorrow we can do it. Fastest in practice, Hudson is first to the start. The gap to Joe Bay is 11 championship points. For Neil Hudson, August 16th, 1981 is one of the most important days of his career. Perhaps slowed down by tension, both championship contenders make poor starts. Joe Bay is 12th, Hudson 13th but there are 40 minutes ahead of them to get through the field. For Hudson, there is now an extra incentive to get the best possible finishing position. Joby is out, sidelined after 11 laps when the pain from an injured arm proved unbearable. Hudson is giving a superb display of tenacious riding and making a great climb back through the field. At the checkered flag, Van Der Ven is first and Hudson is in fourth place. His eight points put him just three points behind Joe Bay. The stage is set for a dramatic climax. Seven. 27, that's the number of places that Neil Hudson has to make up after the first lap crash. But, encouraged by his pit crew, he's making those places. He's climbing through the field, but it's a long way to go. Fast starting, Joe Bay has missed the pileup, and on lap two, he holds second place. His crown looks safe. But 
Hudson doesn't give up easily, and he's riding better than he has done all year. After 20 minutes, a signal from his pit tells Hudson that Joe Bay's injured arm has forced him to retire again. Now all he needs is seventh place for the final four points which will make him world champion. Flag falls with Hudson in sixth position. The title is his. As Heike Mukula sprays the champagne, a new world title is added to the Yamaha list. Neil Hudson started racing as a 12-year-old schoolboy. Now he's 24 and a member of a factory team. He's also a member of that select group of racers that can call themselves world champion. 12 years of effort, 12 years of devotion to a sport that he loves. For this young English rider, this day in the sandy country of Appledorn is a dream come true. is now a very friendly sport. Um, all the friends I know are through motocross and my wife I met at a motocross race and for many years now I meet many foreign people at the race and everyone is very good friends. My father and mother and brother and sister they all, all join in the motocross Motocross is, is my life and my family's life. 